Let's turn to John chapter 16 as we continue our study through this gospel according to John. John chapter 16, and my text is going to be from verse 16 down to verse 27. I've entitled this message, Sorrows and Joys of Christ's Death. We've just sung rejoicing in the death of the Lord Jesus Christ, but it was through sorrow that these disciples that were following Christ saw him suffer and die. And it was necessary that there be that sorrow in order then that there be the joy. There's nothing about the death of Christ that you can look at and think, oh, how joyous that must have been for him to suffer as he did. But the Lord, none of that moved him to where it says, who for the joy that was set before him. What was his joy even through this time of sorrow? His joy was to satisfy his father. That's why he came. His eyes were ever on his father to earn and establish that righteousness necessary for God then to be just, to declare sinners that had been given to Christ, declare them to be righteous. When you look at these disciples, there wasn't anything in them, just like there's nothing in us that we could ever look to and say, well, it's because of that in me that God saved me. No, it's all in Christ. It's all in what he endured and suffered for his people. So this was a time of sorrow that the Lord was preparing them for. But even their sorrow in the face of what he was telling them couldn't compare to what he would endure. Bearing the sin of his people. I've often said that if the one condition for salvation for any one of us was simply for God to say, I want you to completely feel the weight of your sin as it is before a holy God. None of us could do it. We couldn't even begin to understand what it is to be a sinner. We can't even begin to understand what it is for God to be holy. Hence the need for this mediator, the Lord Jesus Christ. So here's the context then as he prepares them. He's all, they're already on their way to Gethsemane. They've already left that upper room where they had celebrated that last Passover meal. There wasn't to be any more because he is that Passover. He was about ready to lay down his life at that time when all of the other Jews were celebrating a physical Passover lamb. According to scriptures, he was to be offered up as the lamb of God. So everything's moving in that direction. And so in verse 16, our Lord says to them, A little while, and ye shall not see me. And again, a little while, and ye shall see me, because I go to the Father. Then said some of his disciples among themselves, What is this that he saith unto us, A little while, and ye shall not see me? And again, a little while, and ye shall see me, and because I go to the Father. Aren't you glad when someone else asks the questions for you because you're thankful? Well, I had that question too, like in a classroom, but someone else had asked it, so now I get to listen to the answer. But they're communing among themselves here, all the while the Lord's right there. Then they said, therefore, what is this that he saith a little while? We cannot tell what he saith. Isn't it interesting that our first point of reference typically is other men rather than coming to the Lord with it? We'd rather hear what somebody else has to say about it. Let me go read another commentary on this. And it says in verse 19, Now Jesus knew <laughs> that they were desirous to ask him. Well, he knows all things. He's God in the flesh. And so he said unto them, Do ye inquire among yourselves of that I said? 
a little while and ye shall not see me and again a little while and ye shall see me verily verily I say unto you here's the sorrow that ye shall weep and lament but the world shall rejoice because the world hated this Christ and ye shall be what sorrowful but here's the part and this is why the title of the message is sorrows and joys of Christ's death your sorrow shall be turned into joy a woman when she is in travail with sorrow because her hour is come but as soon as she is delivered of the child she remembereth no more the anguish it isn't interesting that our Lord is talking about his death as a woman in travail he uses proverbs and parables here that help us understand this and though there's much travail in that birth yet once the child is brought forth she remembereth no more the anguish for joy that a man is born into the world and ye now therefore have sorrow but I will see you again and your heart shall rejoice and your joy no man taketh from you and in that day ye shall ask me nothing why because now it will all be clear up to the point of Christ's death burial and resurrection there are many things they still didn't understand but the Lord didn't leave them alone but in that day when I shall see you again there he's clearly talking about in his resurrection verily verily I say unto you whatsoever ye shall ask the father in my name he will give it you hitherto have ye asked nothing in my name ask and ye shall receive that your joy may be full <clears throat> interesting that he says that on the heels of their all asking one another <laughs> he said no don't ask one another ask me Come to me. The Lord delights in hearing us as needy children come to him. Verse 25. These things have I spoken unto you in Proverbs. Remember what our Lord said about Proverbs. It wasn't for those that are without. But for those who are children of the kingdom. That's why he spoke in Proverbs. To cause us to think and to ponder. But it takes the spirit of God to understand that the time cometh when I shall no more speak unto you in Proverbs but I shall show you plainly of the Father at that day ye shall ask in my name and I say unto you say not unto you that I will pray the Father for you for the Father himself loveth you because ye have loved me and have believed that I came out from God and then verse 28, I came forth from the Father and am come into the world. Again, I leave the world and go to the Father. So here our Lord continues to prepare his disciples for his impending death and departure. And knew that this would make them sorrowful. But their ultimate joy again as the spirit of Christ revealed him in them and continued to teach them that it would be that same spirit that sustained them in uh, verse 16 this is an allegory a proverb that clearly the Lord spoke to bring understanding and uh, even though it mystified them we look back on it and think, well, why couldn't they understand it? Well, <laughs> we've got the rest of Scripture to help us. At this point, none of this had been written yet. John went back afterward, and as the Spirit brought these things to his recollection, he wrote them, and therefore we have the inspired word. So let's don't be pointing the finger too heavily at them and say, well, why couldn't they understand about this? We have the full revelation today, and I'm thankful that we do. But verses 16 to 18, just going back over these scriptures, 
we see how the Lord, knowing the nature of their flesh, that they would sorrow in view of his departure. He says there in verse 16, a little while and ye shall not see me. Well, what was he talking about there? He's talking about dying and being buried in the tomb for three days, three nights. And all of this according to what he had been telling them all along. It's somewhat like with our loved ones, I think of military personnel that are going to be deployed and they're sent overseas. They don't know how long it's going to be. They have families back here. And so the dad might well be preparing the family for that day of departure. And so they know about it, but it doesn't really hit home until that morning when dad gets up and says, I have to leave. Then you see the tears and the sorrow. I liken that just as a small picture to what our Lord Jesus Christ is doing here, the captain of salvation. He's about ready to go to war and do it on behalf of these motley disciples that had no clue as to what was ahead. And the Lord is preparing them for that hour. Something think about it. This was foreordained from before time, but now the fullness of the time. God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law, that he might redeem. That redemption would require nothing less than his shed blood. The ransom price that would need to be paid. Had he walked with his disciples all this while and told them, I'm leaving you now, and simply ascended up into glory, there would be no salvation. He would have proved himself to be that perfect man in the flesh as the God man, but salvation was not complete until he laid down his life, shed his blood. And truly that would be in a little while. Stop and think about that, that from before time this was ordained. And then you read the Old Testament, all those sacrifices in the Old Testament, types, pictures, and prophecies setting forth his coming and his doing and his dying. And now, in a little while, now was the hour. And so he speaks to them here of that hour. Really, when you consider this was on the eve of his being condemned, we're, we're talking about very few hours left for this to be accomplished and for him to be taken away to be crucified. And again, there wasn't anything in his work that they could do to accompany him. It would be up to a point, but even as it says there in Zechariah chapter 13, smite the shepherd and the sheep scatter. God purposed it that way. Again, you can point your finger at him and think, well, if I'd have been there, I wouldn't have done that. Yes, you would have. There's not a one of us that would have ever been able to follow him, even as Peter said boldly, he'd follow him even unto death. And the Lord said, Peter, before the cock crows, you're going to deny me three times. And that's still coming up. When he was taken into that judgment hall, that's when he began to be taken away from them. When they came and seized him in the garden. And you remember Peter took out his sword and he was trying to take off the servant's ear a head, basically, I think it was what it was. And he got a, his ear and the Lord picked it up and put it back on him. He said, Peter, put your sword away. These things must be. It shows us that in this matter of salvation, there's nothing that any of us can ever think of contributing. We're the needy ones, not Christ. A lot of times today, this Jesus being preached is one that needs man's help. He really would like to get this thing of salvation done, but boy, we got to get an army behind him helping him. That's not the Christ of Scripture. We need him. He doesn't need us. And so when he says here in verse 16, a little while and ye shall see me because I go to the Father. They would see him again when he rose again. This week I had someone ask me this question. Well, when Christ died, did he actually physically or in, did he in his spirit go to the Father? How was that? Well, 
Just remember, <laughs> he was in the presence of the Father already when he died on that cross. And Christ is the temple. But at the same time, he was the high priest. And at the same time, he was the sacrifice. And at the same time, he was that one who entered in between the veil. In Hebrews, it says, when the veil was rent in twain, and it describes it being the veil of his flesh. So he wasn't physically or spiritually transported during those three days that he went. That he says that, that people say, well, he had to present himself to the Father. The Father was already present. If you want to look at what the scriptures have to say about it, because we just read it there in Acts chapter 2, where Peter said it was not possible that his soul should see corruption. And the way it's put over there in Acts chapter 2, I'll just refer back to it so I get it quoted right. Verse 27, because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell. That's where a lot of people think, well, then he went to hell. No, that word hell really should be translated Sheol or Hades. And during that time that he was in the grave, from what we can understand in Scripture, he would have been in that grave where all those of the Old Testament were waiting for their redemption. That's called Abraham's bosom. And that he would have been in their presence at that time, even when he told the thief on the cross, today you'll be with me in paradise. That word isn't the word heaven. There was, it wasn't until Christ ascended into heaven that he took those with him. Where it says captivity was led captive. Where were they captive? They were in that grave. They were in that shield. The place of the dead where there was a great gulf dividing that's where Christ gave the example of the rich man and Lazarus. Where was Lazarus? He was in Abraham's bosom. What was he doing there? Waiting for the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, his redemption. I believe that's what Job was talking about when he said, I know that my Redeemer liveth and shall stand on this earth. Job would have been waiting. All of those would have been waiting. Because this was going to be the hour of their justification. And what would Christ be doing? He didn't go there to preach to the, to the ones that were, you know, condemned. And somehow, as some preach, gave them a second opportunity to believe. No. He would have been there for his elect. Those that had died and were waiting this hour. I believe that's why it says when he died, what happened? There was an earthquake. And there were many of the Old Testament saints. Why were they called saints now? Because they've been justified by his death. And they came forth from the grave. Read that. That's a miraculous thing. Doesn't tell us a whole lot about it. But they were walking around Jerusalem. You say, how could that be? Well, Christ had gone, come to redeem them. And therein was their redemption. That's where that justification occurred. People will mock justification at the cross and say, well, you're saying that Abraham died and he wasn't justified? Yep. You mean Job died and he wasn't justified? Yep. David? Yep. They waited for that justification to be accomplished. And here it is, this hour. And I believe that's the sense here when the, the Lord is telling them, A little while and ye shall not see me, and again a little while and ye shall see me because I go to the Father. When he said go to the Father, he's talking about on the cross, presenting himself as that lamb that the Father might be satisfied in observing him and seeing that perfect lamb and laying down his life. That's all it was. That's what it took. He didn't have to physically go up in the presence of the Father. The Father was with him. Like I said, he was the temple. He was the high priest. He entered in beyond the veil as the lamb, the blood shed. All these things were to occur. That's why he said, you'll, you'll not see me during that interval between his death and his resurrection, we know that the disciples 
lost hope. This is another reason why I say I'm so thankful that my justification before God doesn't depend upon me, what I see and what I hope and what I believe, because it's weak. In fact, over in Luke chapter 24, when Christ did rise from the grave, you can talk, you talk about not having any hope left to themselves without the presence of Christ. That would be our case. But here in Luke chapter 24, as the Lord appeared unto these on the road to Emmaus, it says there in verse 13, Behold, two of them went that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was from Jerusalem about three score furlongs. What same day? This was the day of Christ's resurrection. The day when they discovered the tomb to be empty. Because that's what's in verse 12. And it says there, they talked together of all these things which had happened. So here, here they are talking with each other, just like the disciples were talking with each other. In the presence of Christ, it came to pass that while they communed together and reasoned, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were holden that they should not know him. Just like before he went to the cross, they could only see and know what Christ by his spirit was pleased to reveal unto them. And he already told them, I have many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. That's how the Lord teaches us. He never abandons us because of our lack of faith, but that's why he came to draw us all the more through these times to himself. And he said, verse 17, unto them, what manner of communication are these that ye have one to another as you walk and are sad. It's not that the Lord didn't know. Again, he asked the question to draw out of them their need. And the one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answering, said unto him, Art thou only a stranger in Jerusalem, and hast not known the things which are come to pass there in these days? And he said unto them, What things? Again, it was for the purpose of drawing out of them this confession. And they said unto him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, which was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and have crucified him. Look at verse 21. But we trusted. He didn't, they weren't saying, but we're, we're trusting that who he was and said is, is still so. He said, we trusted that it had been he which should have redeemed Israel. And beside all this, today is the third day since these things were done. Yea, and certain women also of our company made us astonished, which were early of the sepul at the sepulcher. And when they found not his body, they came saying that, they also had seen a vision of angels which had said that he was alive. And certain of them which were with us went to the sepulcher and found it even so as the women had said, but him they saw not. Then he said unto them, O fools and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And wouldn't you have loved to have been there? Because it says, beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. You say, well, how, how did he know the scriptures so well? He's the author. All the way back there, Old Testament. And then as they drew now, you know, the rest of the story. Their eyes were open and they knew who he was and he parted on his way. But that's the way it is and would be were it not for Christ being pleased to give us eyes to see. Nothing in this matter of salvation is conditioned on us. People often ask you, well, how much do you need to know in order to be saved? That's a classic question. Well, I'll tell you, if salvation were in any way based on my knowing, there would be no salvation. It's not me knowing him. It's him having known me. Salvation 
is not in how I perceive him at any one time. It's how God has perceived me through the death of his son that I'm saved. A lot of people like to ask you that question. When were you saved? And someone will say, well, I got, I got saved when I was six years old. Well, that's too late because salvation, if any are saved, it occurred there when Christ died on the cross, shed his blood. And if we have any knowledge of him today, it's because he, by his spirit, was pleased to draw us. Otherwise, we would be left in darkness. But isn't this great as we read on through here in John 16? He said, he said you'll not see me. He's talking about that time he would be in the grave. But then he says, you will see me. And that's what puzzled him. Not see you, now we will see you. Again, a little while. What was he talking about? Because the way that is put there in the, the Greek, when it says a little while in verse 16, and ye shall see me, he's literally, it, it's a, a word that means you'll see me with bodily eyes. So he's talking here not spiritually, although it takes eyes to see him spirit, but with your very own eyes, you're going to see me again after this is all said and done. That's what Job spoke of all the way back there in his book. I know that my Redeemer liveth and on this earth shall stand and what my eyes shall behold him. I truly believe that based on that, he would have been one that of those Old Testament saints that the Lord brought forth out of the grave and saw the Lord with his eyes. But this is what the Lord is saying here to his disciples. But it took the Lord teaching them. And again, they were saying this to one another. We don't know what he's saying, but I'm thankful that the Lord has given us his word so that we can understand. Now move on down to verse 19 to 22. We've already read this other portion. But here the Lord is explaining that that sorrow that would come, that would turn into joy. And he knew that they desired to ask him, as it says there in verse 19, but they needed their hearts and their minds prepared for what he was about to endure. I'm thankful even here, the Lord knowing <laughs> what a tender shepherd he is. He's not beating his sheep like, why can't you understand? Knowing that they were desirous to ask him, he said unto them. That's always the way it is. The Lord knows the troubles of our own heart. Sometimes we can feel at times perhaps he doesn't. But he's ever near. He ever cares. He's that tender shepherd that takes his sheep in his arms and carries them. I'm thankful it's that way. But he reminds them that this would be a time of sorrow. There in verse 20. You shall weep and lament. This is not just a quiet weeping. This, this is a wailing, a crying at the thought of what Christ would endure. You know, they loved him. Think about this time they'd spent with him all this time. But they loved him because he first loved them. That's the way it always is. And he says, you're going to be sorrowful, but that sorrow would be turned into joy. They would see Christ suffering in his sorrow, but that would bring great sorrow upon them, and that within a few hours. You say, well, what was there to be sorrowful about? Well, think about someone you love, and now that relationship is cut off in death. There is a sorrow. We don't sorrow as the world, especially if it's someone that is the Lord's. But nonetheless, there is sorrow. We bear that in our being. That's how God has made us. There would be the sorrow of the humiliation that they would watch. They would see this one die on their behalf. But oh, what humiliation that he should die in this way. That, that shepherd was to be smitten by that sword. That's what it says there in Zechariah 13 again. Arise, O sword, against thy shepherd and thy fellow. That's how God perceived his son. 
You think about the last time that that sword was seen was back there in uh, the Garden of Eden when the angel appeared and that sword kept them from partaking of the tree of life. Now, suddenly it appears again after all those years. Where? To be plunged into the Son of God. He bore that sword that we might freely partake of the tree of life. Christ! Can you see why he says first sorrow, then joy? Sorrow, even at the seeming victory of the enemies, where they mocked him, I can't imagine. Sorrow, as we saw in Luke 24 already, because they had hoped, and now that hope was taken away. But again, I'm thankful that the Lord does not leave his own in despair. That's why he gave that particular proverb in verse 21 of a woman in travail. Think about the travail of his soul. That's the same word that's used. There was a travail of Christ's soul as he bore the sin of his people. He wasn't a sinner in any way. But he bore that sin and it's described as a birth. What came out of Christ's travail as a woman giving birth of people now justified, now reconciled, now redeemed because of his death, his shed blood. That's a beautiful picture. I, I think all the way back there to Adam, when uh, Adam, the Lord made him, and then what did he do? He put him in a deep sleep and brought out of his side a woman. <laughs> Woe man out of his side. That's, that's a picture of the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. How out of his death now comes joy. Just like when Adam then awoke. And there was that woman that the Lord had made for him. Just like Christ when he raised from the grave. What joy it was for him now. To go and gather them again one by one. Where did he find the disciples? In a room locked up in fear. But what did he speak to them? Peace. That's the joy that comes through the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's why, why he told them. He said, I'll see you again. And what? Your heart will rejoice. Isn't that the way it's put there? I'll see you again and your heart will rejoice. Verse 22. And your joy no man taketh from you. We have people today that they don't like the Christ. In whom he has brought us to believe. There is a Jesus being preached out there. But it's not this one. This is the glorious, victorious, successful Savior that's going to have everyone. There's no stillbirths with him. He's going to have everyone that he redeemed. He said so. Of all that the Father's given me, I'll not lose one. Boy, that's joyous. And oh, now the joy that when the Lord reveals that you are one of those. I get people sometimes ask me, well, do you think I'm one of the Lord's? Go deal with the Lord on that one. You don't want to hear me giving you any kind of assurance. But if he speaks peace, if he opens your eyes and causes you to see what his death accomplished for the worst of sinners, and you can identify as that worst of sinners, and he brings you to bow, I'll tell you, the peace he gives, the joy to know that it's not anything I do, but it's in who he is and what he's accomplished. And that joy, no man, verse 22, can take from you. And that's why he tells them there in verse 23, and I'll probably come back to this. There's a lot here. When he speaks of, ye shall ask the Father in my name, and he will give it you. That means that when the Lord teaches you of himself, it gives you pause. We're not like the world, like Christ taught his disciples. Don't be like the world that thinks by multiplying their words, somehow they're going to be heard. Some of the prayers that we find in Scripture recorded were very short prayers. How about the prayer of the publican in the temple? <laughs> Did not even look heavenward, but beat his breast and said, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. That's it. That's it. But that was a prayer drawn out of his heart by the Spirit of God. I believe that's the sense here, and I want to come back to it because it gets into how it is we ask. If we know we're the Lord's, how is it that we can ask whatever in his name 
and he'll give it. I'll tell you this, if the Lord's taught you, you're not going to want to ask anything that is contrary to what the Lord wills. And that's why he taught his disciples. The very first thing he said, they call it the Lord's Prayer, but it's really the disciples' prayer. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Not my will be done, but thy will be done on earth even as it is in heaven. That's the spirit that brings us to seek the Lord and his glory in that. Well, I hope that's helpful.